Hello everyone and welcome to another episode in the Shared Ireland podcast series. Today um, I am at the Queen's University at the School of Law and um, I'm delighted to introduce an old friend of Shared Ireland's, Professor Colin Harvey. And with him today we are delighted to be joined by Barrister Mark Bassett. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, guys, I guess um, we always start off by um, asking our guests to outline for the benefit of our listeners and uh, for anybody that maybe isn't aware fully of who you are and what you are to outline maybe a little bit about your background uh, I guess what brought you to uh, into the certain subject that you're into yourself um, Mark you're obviously a barrister uh, could you maybe give our listeners a little bit about your background Thanks. Uh, I was born in Dublin uh, in 1981, uh, and at the time, my my dad was working in Copenhagen. Uh, so the, for the first four years of my life, I lived in in Denmark. Uh, then we came back to to Ireland and uh, started primary school in Dublin. But uh, within a year or two, uh, my dad had a posting to Australia, so we uh, moved to Canberra and lived there for four and a half years. Uh, so I was always conscious of, of, of being Irish, but outside of Ireland and kind of interested in, in Ireland's place in the world. And then I had moved back to Dublin from Australia in 1993 and uh, went to secondary school in, in Castle Rock and then on from there to uh, study law in UCD. Very good. So you've, you've certainly had a, uh, an experience of living in different countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, had the opportunity to live in Spain also for a year during, what during part college. Of Spain? So, uh, I was in Salamanca. Oh, uh, very good. I lived there, funny enough, for a couple of years myself. Not yeah. my particular part, but very good. And do you find that that helped to kind of broaden your horizons and look at the world through maybe different lenses? I think so, yeah. my uh, The first kind of interest in politics I can remember from uh, Australia would have been... Uh, the, the Australian Labour governments, uh, Bob Hawke and then uh, Paul Keating, and a kind of an aspect that came up with that, with Paul Keating in particular, was a, a kind of re or an emphasising of Australian identity uh, separated from the, the kind of symbols of, of the British monarchy. So that, that, that interested me at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one, when we were living in Canberra, uh, was a, a kind of Croatian neighbourhood, and I'd played for the a football team which is called Deacon Croatia and uh, at that time it was the, the breakup of Yugoslavia so a lot of my friends would have been uh, their families uh, would have been affected by the the war in, in Yugoslavia so I remember you know one of the first kind of uh, international crises that that, that that I was interested at the time was the Yugoslavian wars mm -hmm. very good and Colin, obviously we've had you on our podcast before and um, thank you for agreeing to take part again. Yeah. Um, most of our listeners, yeah. I would imagine, would um, be pretty familiar with you and your work by now. But People are fed up listening to me at this <laughs> point, so it's good nope. to hear from somebody else. Nobody's ever fed up listening <laughs> to you, Colin, so <laughs> okay. you're, you're yeah. educating our future. Yeah. Right. Um, but maybe for any of our listeners that... Um, uh, missed our first podcast with you. You originally hailed from County Derry. Well, I'm, I, mainly at the moment, I feel old now when I hear somebody who's born in 1980. I was born in 1970 and in, in Derry, and I think as many of listeners will know, know already, really throughout my life and career, very much shaped by particularly the influence of the civil rights movement here, struggles around rights and equality, and that's really shaped all my, my thinking, work and career, both personally and in an academic capacity, but also, you know, increasingly thinking about the, the constitutional future of this this island in that uh, context. I suppose also that I've, I've not just lived born in Derry, but, you know, I've lived in England. I've actually lived in Wales. First job actually was was in Wales. So, you know, I've, 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 I've been about a bit. But ultimately, I think thinking back on it, the sort of formative years in Derry were shaped really. What I've, and it's only you sort of retrofit that when you think backwards. But the importance of human rights and equality to whatever sort of future we're going to have on this island and these islands. For a lot of years, I worked with, for example, my PhD is actually on refugees and asylum seekers 
you know, people who are often invisible or neglected in some of these conversations. And I think it's it's underlined for me that, you know, in the discussion about, for example, Irish reunification and where we might be going in the, in the, in the years ahead, that we frame it in, in human rights terms as well, that we're concerned about how everyone will do on this island, how this island will be a welcoming place for everyone in the time ahead. And I think the best way to do that is to have a very secure human rights framework. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me this, guys, how did you first meet? Because we're going to discuss your joint uh, document that you published in a little bit. But I'm just curious, um, how did your paths cross? Yeah, well, I first met Colin in 2005. In uh, I was doing a, a master's in human rights in Queens here. Uh, and Colin had taught me refugee law and also introduction to, to human rights. Uh, I suppose we started working together uh, really from 2015 and 2016 onwards, uh, beginning with uh, the issue of presidential, uh, sorry, voting rights for in presidential elections for all Irish citizens. So we had done a an event in St. Mary's uh, as part of the FALA on that. And then there was a few uh, few events following on from that, again, about, about voting rights. Uh, then with, with Brexit, there was a, a greater kind of public interest mm-hmm. in uh, how that would, would affect uh, this island. Uh, and there was, a, there was a few opportunities to, to work together on that mm-hmm. also. And uh, the more formal work, I suppose, uh, came with, uh, there was a request from Martine Anderson uh, in the European Parliament to look at the, the question of EU and Irish unity and what aspects of any of both Irish, uh, British and EU law would, would, ha- would have to be considered in advance of referendums on reunification. What sort of a people was Mark Cullen? <laughs> Outstanding, Mark. <laughs> Mark, Mark it's, it's been a pleasure really to work with over a, a long number of years and, you know, Particularly, you know, that work on presidential voting rights that, that we did remains very, very important. You know, people people forget that on a basic issue like voting rights, that the lack of rights for people outside the state. You know, Ireland is a real outlier in terms of issues around voting rights. So that was really important work. We've also given evidence, for example, to Iraqis committees, you know, explaining some of the work they've done as well. But, you know, it's good to work collaboratively. I'm very conscious myself in the academic world to work with somebody who's also a practicing bar- barrister you know out there in the real world too that that i don't float off into the clouds and mark keeps me very grounded i think in in, in what's happening too so it's just been a real pleasure to work with mark over the years he's uh, bounce off each other and, and um keep keep each other absolutely focused. well there, there's a sense in which we're we're both involved in a, in, a, in a range of initiatives things like the constitutional conversations group as well and I think there's been a sense in particularly recent times of an acceleration of sort of civic discussions mm-hmm. about change. And I have to say, along with Mark and many others, it's just been it's great to feel part of something bigger than yourself, that that you're standing really on the threshold of really major change on the island. And just to be a small part of that, along with Mark and many other people. And I think that's what we really want to emphasize today, that it's. It's really a, it's a collective effort mm-hmm. to try and shape and inform the debate that's happening at the moment. I'm just delighted to be part of it. I think universities sometimes, there's a problem in universities that we're sometimes too disengaged from the communities that we're supposed to serve. So I think it's important for academics like myself and others to be fully publicly engaged in work like this. Yeah, there's, there's definitely in recent years, there's different even on social media, and I guess um, groups have popped up like Think 32s, Ireland's future, ourselves shared Ireland, and I guess you know, as you say, to be involved in something, everybody's nobody's connected to each other, but we all have a passion for driving the conversation forward and trying to include everybody in that conversation is vitally yeah. important. Yeah, I think also in relation to that, that and you know, to underline the point about hearing from people like me, like I'm, I'm serious about the. Like I, I've made a contribution in that conversation, but it needs to, to pan out now into a, a wider pool of people mm-hmm. on an inclusive basis. And I do want to specifically th- this morning commend Shared Ireland because you have produced a really remarkable range of podcasts that 
actually in the present moment on this island needs to be better known. It needs to be more widely shared and known because I think the way in which you've produced those conversations on an inclusive, open basis, speaking to a wide range of people across the society is really remarkably impressive. So I do want to commend Shared Ireland for all your work and efforts. Thank you very much. That's um, much appreciated. And we have got a, a fairly extensive team behind the scenes that obviously I'm their mouthpiece. Uh, but they do all the uh, uh, editing and digital work and media and stuff like that. Guys, uh, before we go any further, I just would like to date and timestamp this podcast just before it's in case anything significant happens before we release it. So today is Wednesday, uh, the 12th of February, but hopefully this will be released within a week at least. So I guess um, we're here today to speak about a document that you jointly published um, in October, I believe, 2019, uh, titled The EU and Irish Unity, Planning and Preparing for Constitutional Change in Ireland. But before we discuss that, I guess uh, we better touch on what happened last weekend in the South in the elections with a significant uh, rise in left parties, uh, and in particular Sinn Féin, um, who got 37 seats, um, Fianna Fáil, 37 seats, if you don't include Corla Campa's seat, which was automatically given to him, and Fine Gael in 36, is that correct? I'm not, I'm not, it might be 35. 35, 35 I was going to say. We'll have to fact it's check. Yeah, that yes. before they... uh, but, I, but I guess, um, I suppose, the reason why this is significant to this particular conversation is because Sinn Féin are obviously advocates of... Um, border poll. Uh, they have publicly stated that they want one within five years, I believe. Is that correct, Colin? Yeah, I, th I think that's the policy position. But I think ultimately what's surprised me is that, you know, obviously it's, it's a massive result and clearly there's a there's a major appetite south of the island, but I think on the island as a whole for change and transformation. I think one of the primary issues is that there is around socio-economic transformation. I think people want to see a revolution in relation to economic and social rights in, on the island, in relation to healthcare, housing, employment, the standard of living here, but also equally that there is now a, a growing conversation about setting out a pathway to reunification. And I think what's been remarkable to me is that people need to listen to what's being said because people have been remarkably, I think, solution focused and dignified in their argument. Nobody is saying, as far as I can hear, that this thing is going to happen on Friday or next Thursday or in two weeks time. The language is around responsible and sensible management and preparation for a managed transition on the island of Ireland. And the other thing that, that strikes me watching some of the, particularly the media reaction to this, is that, you know, uh, an Irish Republican Party wins an election in the South and surprise, surprise, uh, wants to see Irish reunification. You know, who knew? Who knew that Sinn Féin was committed to Irish reunification? You know, nobody should be surprised by, by that. <coughs> nobody should be surprised that Mary Lou has been very quickly articulating that case very coherently as to why that, that should happen. So I think too many people, as you know, in the South, we, we've all been to events where a politician will stand up and say, I would like to see Irish reunification in my lifetime or the day after tomorrow or some whatever. What, what's been remarkable about the conversation in the last few weeks has been practical, pragmatic and focused. It's been about putting concrete time frames in place and a comp concrete framework in place. It's about being grown up about managing the transition that might be coming in the decade ahead. And that's been ultimately refreshing to see that. Mark, um, during the course of Shared Ireland's existence, as Colin has alluded to a couple of minutes ago, we have went round and we have interviewed people from many different walks of life, including political parties throughout the length and breadth of the island. But when we speak to um, unionists slash loyalists, one of their biggest fears is Sinn Féin having control of what an Irish government says, because their fear is understandably so, that they will drive the whole reunification project a lot quicker than, for example, Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael or any other southern party. 
So bearing that in mind, can you understand the unionist fears about that? I, I can, but uh, ultimately any Irish government uh, is, is going to be a coalition. Uh, it's going to be one that's committed to the, the values of Bunrock and O'Hare and the, the Irish Constitution and also to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, Irish unification cannot happen unless people vote for it uh, in, in both jurisdictions. Uh, Sinn Féin should, as an all-island party, uh, have a better understanding perhaps than, than some of the, the, the parties that are only operating in the Republic about what's required to make a United Ireland an attractive option uh, to everyone. But they are yeah. seen as the bogey party. You know, it's as simple as that. And there are stronger, more colourful language being used to describe them from certain quarters. So again, the only reason why I would like to labour on this point is because I guess what we as in Shared Ireland platform are trying to do is encourage engagement from yeah. everyone. So bearing in mind the new structures potentially in the south how will this help encourage our neighbors to engage well one of the one of the things that should be at the forefront of the uh, debate i would hope is some of the changes uh, that would be necessary within the republic mm -hmm. uh, one of the 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 most important features of the good friday agreement is parity of esteem now, there is much work that will need to be identified and done within the Republic. Uh, one of the most important features is to give uh, equal protection to the status of a British, res British citizen resident uh, in a united Ireland. That's in uh, civil and political voting rights, for instance. Uh, but also there needs to be uh, a recognition that British citizens are entitled to that status in perpetuity and this, there should be no disadvantage uh, to continuing to hold that status in the United Ireland. Uh, so that, that would be one aspect of it. The other I, I would hope would be to show uh, you know, a greater familiarity with some of the aspects of the Irish constitution and also a greater familiarity with government formation in, in Dublin that uh, in the United Ireland uh, a unionist voters will have a, I say a relevance and a, a presence that can't and that never has existed in London so that, that there should be uh, a, a, a strong unionist presence in, in the Oireachtas. Uh, one of the other issues is, is there's likely in the immediate aftermath of reunification that, that there will still be devolved institutions in, in the north so there will still be Stormont I imagine so the I mean uh, Richard Humphreys writes very uh, persuasively on this matter but he, he points out that a lot of the features of the Good Friday Agreement are operable in a united Ireland there would be in effect a, a in some aspects a switch from UK sovereignty to Irish sovereignty so there would be a duty uh, to respect parity of esteem, a duty of rigorous impartiality on an Irish government. There would be representation uh, for the North in Dublin. There would be uh, uh, the same human rights protections. Uh, there would be a, a, a necessity to uh, consult on, on and to agree any any changes to the to the devolved institutions as the executive and the assembly. Colin, um, same kind of question to you, but again, I would like, if you wouldn't mind, to focus more on instead of what will happen mm. after mm. a potential successful yeah. border poll for yeah. pro unity yeah. voices. Before that happens, we need to all sit around several tables and discuss it. And when I say all, that includes the million or over of unionists yeah. here in the north, never mind throughout there. Yeah. How can you, or what can you say to reassure and encourage unionism to join this conversation? 
That's absolutely right. I think one of the main contributions that, that we can make to this is, is by moving beyond, uh, to be candid, the sort of waffle that surrounds this debate at the moment, because I think the sort of very loose, ill-defined language around it can lead to anxiety and uncertainty. What is that waffle that's being spoken about? Well, I think about? what we need to do is have a concrete time frame and framework for taking this forward. There are pragmatic proposals on the table around, for example, establishing a citizens' assembly on an all-island basis to which everyone should be invited and everyone will be welcome to participate. And, and Colin, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. just, go I'm just yeah. going to stop you on that point because, again, this is important, I believe. Yeah. This has been said to me yeah. from unionism. Yeah. Why would we want to participate in an all air and a citizens assembly if it's only going to discuss their worst nightmare? What what incentive would they have to sit around that table? The all <coughs> island cit citizens assembly is really only one part of, of a wider, in my view now, a wider framework and time frame. And just to explain a bit further, a citizens assembly is only one part of that to begin preparing for the possible constitutional futures on the island to which everyone would be welcome and invited but i increasingly think look and um, there's been a lot of talk in recent days about the northern ireland act and the good friday agreement and the powers of the secretary of state for northern ireland in relation to that and we know that the criteria are there we know the amount of discretion the secretary of state has and we know the the, the level of flexibility around the evidence around that I think nobody on this island wants to lead such a massive constitutional conversation to a British Secretary of State. So in addition to the All Island Citizens Assembly and really following on from what Mark has said, the Good Friday Agreement is about relationships across these islands. It's about the totality of relationships. Therefore, a framework needs to be put in place around this conversation that res respects all those relationships around those islands. That's why myself, in addition to what's been proposed around the Citizens Assembly, and we've talked about this as well, that there really does need to be an Irish-British, British-Irish framework to, to frame this. Now, I, I think, for example, agenda item one on the next British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference I would like to see is planning and preparation for this constitutional conversation, knowing that the outcomes might differ. Absolutely, nobody expects unionists and loyalists to, to transform overnight and to be a nationalist and Republicans. Unionists and loyalists, a bit like the civic conversations will, having will want to have their own conversations as well about the propositions in case for remaining within the UK. And you know, people wish, wish people well with that conversation. I think civic unionism will engage with the all island civic conversation. I think for example, parties like the Alliance Party, I would like to see engage I think if I recall rightly on the Convention on the Constitution, the Alliance Party did engage with that. So I think, you know, everyone should be invited. I think political unionism, it is time for leadership in relation to that conversation. But in terms of the outcomes, I think uh, we need to bear in mind that people will have to make propositions. So on the Irish reunification side of that, people will have to make a persuasive case based on evidence. Uh, but people will be, you know, quite justifiably under the agreement making a case for, for remaining in the UK. People want to organise around that. You know, I think what's important in relation to that conversation is that that's inclusive as well. Mm -hmm. So I would flip your question back to you. Um, we've talked about mutual respect and parity of esteem in the future. We've talked about respecting these things in the future in terms of the Good Friday agree Agreement. The question I have for unionism is how is unionism going to do that in the here and now? Not in the, the future, in the here and now in relation to persuading people, for example, that they might want to remain within the current arrangements. So I think, no, no, the outcomes are not predetermined. I don't actually think Irish reunification is inevitable. I think there's hard work to be done to persuade people. I think there's too much complacency around the conversation about Irish reunification. Now, there's a headline, Colin Harvey yeah. does not think that Irish reunification just, is inevitable. Just, just me, let me be crystal clear what I mean by that. I mean that, that there's too much complacency in that narrative that somehow, you know, there's political ideologies. If you think about the old Marxist line that the state would wither away under... Well, it never did, did it? Well, I think some of the language around Irish reunification is rather complacent and self-satisfied and smug, to be honest. The case needs to be made. Unionists need to be shown what their place is in a united Ireland. And I think, going back to an earlier point, I increasingly think, in addition to the All Island Citizens' Assembly, that people like Ireland's future have called for. I think the Irish and British governments need to provide a framework. It needs to begin to look rather like 
the preparations for the Good Friday Agreement. So I think we need to be talking about, for example, perhaps a joint declaration, uh, setting out the parameters of this, because I'll tell you what, I do not want to leave uh, who gets to vote in a referendum in the North. I don't want to actually leave the question itself in the hands of a British Secretary of State. I want the Irish government to be proactive, to be out there, to be in the British Irish governmental conference, to be in the bilateral frameworks, advocating for the, you know, the, the inclusive and the right response. We've argued for an inclusive approach to voting rights. We think in our report that the EU has a fundamental role and interest to play in that as well. But I'm just worried that sometimes the language around Irish unification is just a wee bit too self-satisfied. There's hard work to be put in if we're going to achieve the sort of transformation over the next decade that people want to see on this island. Just I, would, I would agree with Colin that uh, uh, Irish unity is, is not inevitable. Uh, it, it will require a persuasive case to be made uh, in both jurisdictions. Uh, one of the protagonists of that is going to have to be uh, an Irish government. Uh, if we look over the last uh, decade or so, we can see both in, in Ireland and in Britain. You know, the, uh, in around 2008, there was a, a focus and a kind of public attention given to uh, the bailout and austerity. And uh, more recently, there's been a focus on both islands and a reassessment of what each uh, country's relationship should be with European neighbours. Uh, it's now time, I think, for a a reassessment on both islands of the constitutional structures. I mean, there is uh, going to be a, ve a very strong case for a, a further referendum on, on Scottish independence. Mm -hmm. So while the outcome is not inevitable, uh, I think the, the debate is, it you know, it, it's coming up to 25 years from the Good Friday Agreement. A fundamental centrepiece of that was the right of, of self-determination. So the, uh, the there has to be uh, quite a lot of preparatory work uh, done uh, in, in both states uh, to get ready for that so that everybody, when they do get uh, the chance to vote, they, they can feel that they, they have, they're they getting an informed and, and fair choice. Colin, you mentioned civic unionism mm -hmm. there, and you also mentioned a group called Ireland's Future. Uh, in January 2019, uh, just over a year ago, yeah. Uh, there was a significant event in the Waterfront Hall where upwards of 2,000 people attended. And I guess it was a landmark occasion because, you know, it brought this conversation to the mainstream and it was well covered um, by all the media. Is there an equivalent to Ireland's future, which would be civic nationalism? Have they got a counterpart as in civic unionism? There doesn't seem to be one coherent collective voice coming from that uh, section of the community. Is that a fair comment or not? Well, again, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be other people better placed than me to, to comment on, on what conversations are happening within unionism and loyalism. I'm, I'm acutely aware in this society that sometimes conversations happen like we're having today, which is a conversation on a podcast that everybody gets to, to listen to and agree with or disagree with what we have to say. But some conversations, you know, can, can be happening out there that maybe aren't so public, mm -hmm. that are quiet conversations, that are uncomfortable, private conversations between people. My sense in this society is all those sorts of conversations are happening. Maybe some of them are well known in public and on podcasts. Uh, but maybe some of those conversations are also slightly quieter conversations mm -hmm. with people. My sense is there are civic unionist conversations happening out there. There's already, actually in your own podcast series, you know, some of the contributions you've had from people from the unionist community thinking out loud about this discussion. So I think there's more work to do about that. I think it has to be a respectful discussion as well. You know, part of the Mark, absolutely right. What people forget is the Good Friday Agreement frames the, the present, but also will frame the future as well. And if we're to be respectful, we have to recognise that people have a right to be robustly supportive of Irish unification. Sometimes people forget that in this jurisdiction. But people have also a right to be robustly supportive of the union as well. You know, we can't expect unionists and loyalists, and I think it will be ultimately disrespectful to simply sort of transition overnight to being Irish Republicans and Nationalists, that's not the case. I think there's a there's a onus to be clear what 
the shape of this new Ireland will actually look like, what place unionism, what place British citizens will have in it. But we also have to respect that unionism and loyalism will want to have conversations about how they will make the case for staying within the UK. We can't expect a sort of monolithic discussion. My sense is, to answer your question, is that there are probably conversations out there happening now that maybe aren't up in headlights, but they're happening and they're moving. And my sense is the traction on this, albeit the outcome is not inevitable, the, the conversation is already happening. Like anybody who thinks it isn't is, is just living in a different uh, a, a planet, you know. Um, it, it's happening out there, it's everywhere. You know, people in the university sector, it's, it's, it's a non-stop discussion. Mm -hmm. So it's happening, the outcome isn't inevitable. But, you know, we want to encourage everybody to be part of what is essentially a conversation. And people, you know, I've been accused of overusing the word conversation. And I know I have a habit of repeating myself. But we mean that conversation can't be a monologue. It has to be involved more than one person. And so we encourage people to, to join in in that spirit. I, I will never yeah. apologize for using yeah. the word conversation because it's actually yeah. one of our strap lines. Yeah. You know, talk. That's, you know. Uh, funny you just mentioned conversations I speak quite a lot to Reverend Gary Mason transforming conflict mm -hmm. and his um, buzzword is learning how to disagree respectfully mm -hmm. and I think you know that's very important yeah. as we move yeah. into these conversations gentlemen we um, will move on to your document mm -hmm. as I alluded to at the start published in October 2019 entitled the EU and Irish unity planning and preparing for constitutional change in Ireland um, Mark, you indicated that, was it Martina Anderson, approached you to do something around this? Yes, uh, before the summer uh, of last year, myself and Colin were uh, asked whether we, we could look at uh, the issue of Irish unification uh, in EU law. So that would be uh, looking at uh, the constitutional mechanisms in both uh, Britain and the UK and in Ireland and how uh, that could be accommodated or supported uh, by the institutions of the European Union and in EU law. So we uh, spent last summer uh, researching and writing and then the, the piece was completed in, in September and then we had the opportunity to uh, present it uh, in the European Parliament in October. Let us see. Recently, you were in London presenting it too. No? It's been. I think it's been launched all, all over Europe at this point. So <laughs> yeah. it, I think it's been launched very, very widely. Yeah. yeah so there's a there's a launch in yeah. the uh, Aractus uh, in in October as well. So it was a very uh, interesting and, and rewarding piece of work. And you know, at the start, I wasn't entirely sure how how you know how much uh, EU law covers this particular point, but. Mm -hmm. uh, Having, having spent uh, the summer reading about German unification in particular uh, and the uh, admirable role played by the, the institutions, uh, and we also then looked at uh, the European Union's position with regard to, to Cyprus and mm -hmm. you know, an express support uh, for the reunification of uh, that island. Uh, we also looked at uh, rights which are contained in EU law and uh, some of the obligations uh, under economic and, and monetary union but the i suppose the, the most important uh, piece of eu law was a, de was a decision of the european council uh, in april of 2017 and it was a unanimous agreement of the all the member state governments that uh, in the case of uh, reunified Ireland that it would uh, automatically become a uh, remain a member state of the European Union so there'd be no need for treaty amendments or there'd be no need for and that's one of the benefits that Irish citizens would have over Scottish citizens because that not that has not been made clear to them is not correct yes uh, in the Scottish referendum uh, the Barroso Commission and both the the UK governments had made the case that uh, a, a an independent Scotland would find itself outside of the, the European Union and it would have to adhere to the uh, the accession criteria and there would be uh, a necessity for European Parliament and uh, each member state to, to ratify that. Uh, not entirely convinced that that was 
true uh, because Scotland was a that was part of the UK and as part of the European Union uh, and Scottish residents for, for would have been uh, EU citizens but that that had at least some traction in the in, in the Scottish independence uh, referendum debate it doesn't it, sh- it shouldn't have any here it is a, a, v- a very clear position from the European Union that if the two jurisdictions on this island endorse reunification uh, the EU will support it it'll support it in, in accordance with uh, its own values of uh, human rights the rule of law democracy it will accommodate it in accordance with uh, public international law so the, the idea of a, of a moving border of, of a state and uh, the one of the, the interesting things will be to and hopefully the EU will be at the forefront of it is developing or sorry identifying again how British citizens on the island of Ireland are going to be protected uh, that status is going to be protected not only in Irish constitutional law but also in EU law Colin, what are the benefits, I guess, of Ireland as an island being back in the EU and as opposed to 26 counties being in and 6 counties being left out? Well, in a sense, there's obviously one thing to to point out is the report was completed in September, October last year, so events are moving on and have developed uh, around that, which is important to, to highlight. But... Look, Irish citizens in the north are are still Irish citizens, and they're still European Union citizens. Um, the European Union has made clear, the Council made clear that we can automatically return to the European Union. So, as part of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, we have what many people regard as a sort of complex, messy, complicated protocol and arrangement that uh, we'll see how that works out over the longer term. Um, that in itself has a trajectory that will be interesting to watch, but it just may be the case that over the longer term on this island and in the north, that people, like I've just termed, you know, talked about full family <coughs> membership, but people, it just means that people may simply want that option. And I think what we've tried to, 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 to point is, is out that, that reframes the conversation you know about Irish reunification you know when you've one bit of the island outside the EU and one bit inside the EU when the border on the island of Ireland becomes an external border of the EU when the journey like Mark talked about being brought up in Dublin when the journey from Belfast to Dublin becomes a journey into and out of the EU it has a massive practical and symbolic impact in relation to the north so you know in a sense what we've been doing in this planning and preparing work is to say that we think that will change the nature of the discussion here majority of people want to remain in the eu i think myself there's there's an onus now on all those people who argued about remaining in the eu to join this conversation about the return option to the eu so and all the report tries to do really at a on a preliminary basis and we're conscious that there's more research and more work needs to be done that the european union has a role in that can play a role in that. And what finally in, in, in the trips, you know, we've been to Brussels to launch this and all this. What, what pick up in Brussels is the European governments and others, they get this. You know, they get they get this as a possible solution to some of the issues raised by Brexit. But what you also sometimes hear is well why why isn't the Irish government pressing us on this? Why isn't the Irish state itself pushing this if this is such an obvious solution? So What's interesting about what's happened in recent weeks is the p- potential that we may have in the time ahead an Irish government that is actually proactively pushing this, not yes. engaging in sort of airy rhetoric about a future United Ireland, but concretely and practically arguing within the context of the future relationship discussion that will happen this year that the EU has a role to play in that. And our report really is just a, a preliminary piece of research that t- that wants to in a sense help people who are engaging in that conversation and you know we we ourselves want to continue this work and build on it in the year ahead because we're conscious that you know the withdrawal agreement and the protocol is only phase one mm-hmm. we're now into the eu uk discussions and you know the real prospect of an irish government within the eu that is not using all the old rhetoric and airy promises about the future but is concretely focused 
on achieving the reunification of this island and making the kiss. Because just to underline again, what struck me about the trips to Brussels and what struck me engaging with uh, people there was that people in Europe get this. I see Mary Lou has already publicly called for the EU to come out and support Yes, uh, well, w w what should be uh, a feature of the, the future relationship, that whether that there's been some discussion about whether there's going to be a, a free trade agreement uh, on between the U UK and the EU along the styles of a Canada approach, mm -hmm. or uh, possibly more likely an association agreement uh, comparable to the EU's relations with uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. But in either of those setups, uh, there are human rights clauses. They, uh, the trading relationship is, is also based on shared values, uh, one of which uh, is the values of the, the UN Charter. Well, central to that is uh, the right of self-determination. So I would hope that within the uh, EU uh, priorities and, and the UK priorities is a recognition of the right of Irish reunification. Now, this is not a new development. This is a, an important feature of the Irish constitution. It's an important feature of the UK constitution in the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Act. Uh, it's now a feature of EU law in the with, withdrawal agreements, which recognises the protection of the agreement in all its parts. Mm -hmm. The centrepiece of that is reunification. Uh, and also in international law, you know, the, the right of self-determination is sometimes controversial in, in, in how it uh, is given effect. Well, there's no debate here. It's, uh, it's been agreed. It's concurrent referendums uh, in these two jurisdictions. So there is a, uh, a route back uh, for this jurisdiction to uh, the full uh, benefits uh, of EU membership and, and its Irish unity. Uh, on the other side, if, if you were to ask, I think, uh, you know, a British government minister at the moment, you know, what's your vision for the UK in, over the medium term, you would get some sort of version of, you know, there's going to be a, a re-emphasis of the Anglosphere, uh, the, the relations with America are going to be central, and you get something along the lines of, of global Britain. Uh, I'm not sure how that... Uh, what the place of Northern Ireland within the UK uh, fits in with that. I mean, the, uh, the, the arrangements for here, particularly the, the customs union rules that are going to be in place, you know, they don't fit with that. So there is a, uh, an obligation also on, I suppose, the, the British government to, to make that clear to everyone here that, uh, that there are going to be differences between the island of Britain and or greater differences between the island of Britain and uh, this jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. I think that j just to really e echo and underline that point in in the discussions that are that are coming with the European Union. You know, as Mark has said, what, what we need to emphasise is that this isn't stepping outside of any constitutional legal orders. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, it's within the constitutional legal order of the UK. It's in the Irish constitutional context. It's underpinned by international law. And the European Union has clearly recognised it as part of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. You know, all those references to the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts includes the right to self-determination of the people of this island that are there, that again, underpinned by international law. So I think important to just underline that point that in the engagements to come in relation to the EU, <coughs> that this is about recognising the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. But, and there's always a but, yeah. it is solely within the British Secretary of State's remit to determine when, if at all, a bo potential border poll will be called. How can pro-unity voices ensure this happens, Colin? I think we need to, th this is really an urgent issue at the moment, I think in my own, in terms of what I've been hearing in the, even in the last week and days. It just I think reframing it, like we'll go back to what I said earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, the agreement is clear that the right to self determination is a right that belongs to the people of the island of Ireland without external impediment. Mm -hmm. That's the right that people of this Ireland, island have. 
and there's a mechanism in the agreement as to how that will be worked out. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has, if you like, the sort of trigger mechanism in relation to that, both recognised in the draft clauses. When the they believe there's an Ireland. appetite. Well, there's, there's two things to, to underline, there, and there's, this has been judicially tested, right? So the, there's a May component, there's a discretionary component. So Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has a discretion to call this at any time this year. The sort of argument that's out there at the minute that it can only happen when you know the evidence is there that 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 is simply wrong the secretary of state for northern ireland could call out at any time but when it appears likely that a majority of people here would vote for irish unity then there's a compulsion if you like on the secretary of state to do that and where you're right there is a lack of clarity is people are trying to you know second guess what the evidence but might be is that what well, would the secretary of state in your opinion yeah. and i accept yeah. it's only yeah. your opinion yeah. Would they look at the recent elections in the 26 yeah. counties and look at the surge of Sinn Féin, which is obviously pushing for uh, border poll, or are they only allowed to look what's happening within the six counties for their kind of evidence? I think one of the things that is clear at the moment is that, and people shouldn't underestimate, I know there's a lot of strong calls at the moment for clarity and certainty on the criteria. At the moment... The Secretary of State has a lot of flexibility in terms of the balancing of different bits of evidence. You, to take so, point. Yeah. you know, so you know, you could actually make a a reasonably plausible case that given what's happened to unionism in the last number of years, increasingly becoming a minority position electorally here, what's happened in relation to Brexit in terms of the size of the Remain vote uh, and what's happened there in terms of the potential for return. You know, you could make a plausible case now that we're getting close to the conditions being met. For the sake. But what, let me be clear on that. That is why many of us are saying at the moment that I don't want a British Secretary of State to decide next Wednesday to thrust the island of Ireland into this major process of constitutional change without, in a sense, us on this island getting our act together to plan and prepare sensibly. So I think we need to reframe the conversation. I've heard some utterly irresponsible talk in the last week of people saying basically, it's for a British Secretary of State, so you know, just leave it. You know, that would be absolutely idiotic of any Irish government to leave the future of this island solely de de determined in the hands of a British Secretary of State. That is why I just underline again what's been remarkable about the language around this and people need to listen to what is being said. The language has been careful. The language is about planning and preparing over a defined time frame for change. And the reason for that is nobody on this island wants to be left in the hands of the British government in terms of determining the constitutional future. And that's why we need to reframe the discussion. But I really want to at the moment hone in on those people I've heard in the last week who've simply been blithely washing their hands of this issue and saying, well, actually, it's for the Secretary of State alone. That seems to me constitutionally irresponsible. Has already been clear, there's a constitutional obligation and imperative still on the Irish government and the Irish state to achieve the unity of the people and territory on this island. So we need to get our act together on this island fast, I think. In terms of, uh, I agree with what, what Colin uh, said there, uh, in, in, in terms of law, it's up to the the Secretary of State to take into consideration what, what matters uh, he or she believes to be relevant uh, in exercising the discretion and in uh, if, if there's ever a view that the, the duty has been triggered that there is now a majority in, in this jurisdiction but in, in kind of political terms uh, I, I think one of the most important aspects you know if, if an Irish government was to say uh, we, th we now think that it's it's the right time to test the principle of consent to uh, to uh, inv investigate whether or not the uh, Irish unification should come around. That that would be of enormous political weight, and I would expect a, a British government to respond. The I mean the the Good Friday Agreement itself talks about concurrent referendums. So if that right of uh, self determination is to be given effect, it has to be. Uh, the same time in both in both jurisdictions. I'll go to you first on this one, Mark, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Dispel, please, for me, this myth that 
seems to be talked about that unionist farmers will have um, their land uh, taken off them in, in any future reunification project. Uh, well, it's, it's not true. The same uh, rights of, of private property uh, will exist. They're given uh, protection in the, in the Irish constitution as well as uh, in, the, in the European Convention as well. So th that, that shouldn't be a, a concern that, uh, that, that a farmer will, will, will lose his land or her land. Colin, I bring this subject up because Mark um, Daly recently done a report and that was mentioned in it. And um, I'm assuming you don't believe that to be a... No, look, I think one of the... What we've tried to do today in the conversation, the work that we've been doing along with many others, is that there's, a, there's an awful lot of work of myth-busting yeah. to be done around this discussion. Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of... We don't talk to each other enough on the island of Ireland now. There's a lot of myths that go on about what happens in the north and what happens in the south. It needs to be an evidence-based conversation. It needs to be a conversation based on the rights that people have now and what they will have in the future. That is why I think we need things like the Citizens' Assembly established mm -hmm. so as we can just bust some of these myths, mm -hmm. that we can deal with people's anxieties on an evidence-based way. You, you and I, we've all heard story after story after story about what it's really like in the south what it's really like in the north mm -hmm. and some of those conversations need to be informed by evidence in terms of what is actually happening that is why i think you know the, the smart thing to do the mature thing to do the responsible thing to do now for any government which ultimately is about contingency planning for the future set up the citizens assembly get government resources have a minister charged with taking this forward have a unit within a relevant government department perhaps the Taoiseach's office doing the work, preparation, thinking, based on evidence. We need to challenge the myths, and the only way to do that is to move beyond the rhetoric and warm words, you know, to move beyond in my lifetime into concrete planning and preparation around some of the frameworks we've talked about today. So some of the conversations that um, we've been having throughout the course of the last year, uh, people have mentioned the potential, and I guess potential is the right word, for loyalist violence in if, if the inevitable happens, as they would see it. Again, you, nobody can look into the future because there's always potential for anything. But um, do you think that would be a realistic possibility, Mark? Or would it last long? Or would it be quashed pretty quickly? Yeah. Or Well, I, I can understand why people would be concerned about it. And I, I would hope uh, that, that it, it, it wouldn't arise. And one of the most important features of that is two governments uh, to undertake to respect the outcome of, of the referendums uh, wh whatever they are and to work towards implementing that uh, so I can understand why, why people would be uh, afraid of it but I think as a I mean the as a society we've we've moved past that the the, the misery that that type of violence could bring mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can understand why people would be concerned about it but uh, the best way I think is to, is to emphasize uh, there will be rights protections uh, that currently exist within the Good Friday Agreement will continue and a, a, a clear commitment from the two governments uh, that the, the outcome will be implemented. Just before we finish off the podcast, we're at 53 minutes here now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one last question each and it's going to be the same question. So I'm going to go to you first, Colin. Um, I'm a unionist convince me to participate in future conversations about our shared Ireland. Well, I think really want to return to previous discussion as well. I think it's important that the conversation that we're having is shaped by the values and principles of the Good Friday Agreement, including values around peaceful and democratic transition on the island. Like I've talked in the podcast about the British-Irish government's uh, adopting a new joint declaration or even perhaps e an even more formalized agreement to frame some of this and in that document I think there needs to be a recommitment perhaps a sort of you know Mitchell principles again type thing for participants in this society that you know we will approach this conversation peacefully and democratically and I think that's where the conversations need to ensure that people are brought along 
and I think that's why it needs to be inclusive and I think that's why you know actually your series of podcasts and I know I'm overdoing it a bit today it's not just because you're here you know, that idea of including a wide range of voices in these conversations we need to learn the lessons of the last few hundred years and bring everybody uh, with us I think in terms of you're a unionist right in terms of um, in this scenario yeah, I think look there's a remarkable opportunity uh, here in this region to be part of a conversation about how we want to do the next hundred years together we're going to have to share this space whatever it's called in the next hundred years how, how are we going to do that I will with you as a unionist I don't expect unionism unionists to be transformed into Republicans and nationalists and advocates of Irish reunification. I think that in itself would be disrespectful. But what I would like to say as somebody myself, we've working for, in a sense, Irish reunification, that unionism will have a warm, welcome and secure place where people like me will work night and day to make sure that the values of the Good Friday Agreement are respected, that mutual respect is meaningful, that parity of esteem is meaningful, and that unionists and loyalists, our friends and neighbours who share this space together, will be warmly welcomed in the new Ireland, and people like me will fight and argue day and night to make sure that's the case. But you as a unionist, I would say, what I want to hear from you now is, if you believe that the union with Britain should continue for the next 100 years, I want you as a unionist to make the case to me. Persuade me what the arguments will be. Persuade me as to where the mutual respect, party of esteem, human rights and equality agenda will go in the next hundred years. And I will listen to respectfully to what you have to say. I like that. Mark, I, I'm going to apologise before asking this question. I'm going to change my question tell you. Put yourself in the shoes of unionism, okay? Okay. And tell me and Colin and our listeners now why we should remain within the union. And before you do, will this be a very short answer? Uh, well, one of the things... To, uh, but remember now, you're yeah, a unionist, you have to convince yeah, us. Yeah. Well, as a, as a lawyer, uh, you have to sometimes make uh, arguments that you're not wholly convinced of. And okay. you have to put them in kind of, uh, attractive terms. That's a good way to start this uh, conversation. So if I was uh, to convince uh, Colin that uh, the union with, with Britain is... is is the best possible future for uh, Northern Ireland. I would, uh, I suppose, stress the cultural links between the island of, of Ireland and Britain. Uh, we have a shared language. We have a lot of the same uh, humour. Uh, we drive on the same side of the road. Drive on the same side of the road. Uh, the... Uh, I, I, f I find it would be very difficult to make the case on, on, on the basis of previous experience. I mean, th th I can't get past the uh, the manner in which partition was imposed. Was, was it's very unfair of me to put you in yeah. that um, position, <laughs> but um, there, there's a bit of badness in me, and all yeah. time, so I apologise for that, Mark. Yeah. Guys, okay, um, really appreciate um, your time so far. We always ask every guest this um, last question. Oh, it's meant to be on a more light-hearted note or not. Mm. I'll go to yourself first, Colin. If you could invite three people to your fictional dinner party, who would them three people be and why? You know what? I'm going to answer this. See my earlier answer because I've answered this question before. So I'll refer your listeners to my previous podcast. Okay. Because I can't remember now the three. I said I don't want. To, I want to be consistent. Right. Well, go on. Pick, pick, pick three, three new ones for me now. I know, I know you've put no thought into this, but just three yeah. names. I'd be curious to hear. Um, again, I, I think the people I, I mentioned before, you know, I think talked about um, Marlon Robinson, I think at some point as a, as a novelist. People, the direct, film director, Terence Malick. Yes, I remember by, that. I was trying to think who you mentioned before. Spanish, but a, Spanish novelist, Javi Mar Marias, who I, I think I'd be interested 
to talk to as as well at a dinner party. But I'm telling you what, I'm I'm a fairly anti-social person as well, so I don't have very many dinner parties to invite anybody to anyway. So. And come here, yeah. you still don't yeah. do social media, Colin? I don't do social media, but I do recognise its fundamental importance in communicating messages, and I do, um, you know, I do try to. To, 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 to get what I have to say out there as widely as, as possible. So I, 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 I want to acknowledge really the work that people like yourselves do in, in that medium. But, you know, I'm still getting used to using email uh, and text <coughs> messages on my pre prehistoric BlackBerry phone. So yeah, there's a few of us have a theory that, that yeah, you actually yeah, have yeah, a Twitter yeah, account yeah, and a Facebook yeah, account under yeah. an assumed name. Can I don't, you dispel I know, that thought? No, I know that, that that happens out there, but I would like to put on the record today that I have no presence on social media, anonymous or otherwise. So. Very good, okay. very good. Mark, same question to you. If you could invite yeah. three fictional people or not to, or sorry, three people to your fictional dinner party, yeah. who would they be and why? Uh, I'll I'll invite uh, Bob Dylan. He's my favourite singer. Uh, I'll Good invite uh, Larry David, who's uh, the writer of Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he, a lot of his. Uh, it's the funniest person on TV, I think. But I, a lot of his kind of skits are disastrous dinner parties. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting if he went there. Uh, mm -hmm. Third would be hero when I was a kid, was Ronnie Whelan. He was a mm -hmm. footballer with. Mm -hmm. uh, Liverpool uh, and with Ireland. Three pretty decent answers. I wouldn't mind maybe gate crashing that party yeah, myself. You're very <laughs> well. Yeah. Guys, before I go, uh, for the benefit of our listeners, where can your report be found uh, or downloaded? Can you send any links or can you recommend? Yeah, no, I think that one of the things is Queen's has actually put it on. It's uh, th There's a... Uh, something called Queen's QB policy right. uh, on the website that goes under QPOL um, at Queen's and people can Google that and get it. It's also on the GUI NGL website in the European Parliament. But I think mm -hmm. accessibility wise, it may be people just want to click on the Queen's website. Okay, we'll put up a link, to link and they can look at it there. And just the underline again, two, two things. One thing is we're conscious that things have moved on even from, like we were working on the previous iteration of the protocol, for example, Certainly. and that has changed. And there's been two elections and since that been, one in the UK. Yeah, and one so, one, you know, there's been a lot happened since. So there's yeah. an element of, of dating to some of that, of but course. a lot of it remains relevant. But also, like we're very, very keen to hear from people, to, to get, you know, feedback. You know, it would be... We have to acknowledge the fact that there was a bit of reaction to this report when it was released. Some of it not entirely positive either, you know. So uh, we, we are keen to hear pe from people. We are keen to hear views. But what we, I think ultimately what I would like to hear is, like we heard a lot, there was a lot of discussion, for example, around the logo on the front of the report. Like I, I'd be very keen to get feedback on the content you know, very keen to hear what people have to think about what we've actually written within the pages of the document. Like we do know the issue mm. about the logo that's been very heavily vented, but we've got a lot of substance in there. We've even got footnotes and things like that. You know, be keen yeah. to hear from people on the content. Yeah, Mark, I was definitely learn yeah. most from somebody who's, yeah. who's, who's telling you that you're wrong. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to to reassess maybe some of the the assumptions that are in there. But what I mean, it was the, the report was commissioned uh, by Martina Anderson but it, regardless of who would have commissioned this report it would say the same thing because we say this is the position in EU law these are the opportunities these are the challenges in the future uh, you, Colin's right and uh, there's been uh, some important developments but some of the other issues that could be maybe looked at uh, that concern Irish unity in the EU is you know, what kind of representation could there be for uh, the North in the European Parliament in the future, either with unification or as observer status, a possibility? Yeah. Uh, the other one is, is what kind of provisions on self-determination and human rights could be contained within a, a future trading relationship yeah. uh, treaty? Uh, and also, one of the, the, I know I've said it a few times, but really want... Uh, Irish government and, and Irish lawyers to consider very carefully uh, the status of British citizenship in, in Ireland at the moment and in uh, a reunified Ireland. So that part of that could be protections that are uh, replicated in, in, in EU law. So hopefully over the next maybe 12 months, or these are some of the issues that you know, myself and Colin may be looking at. Yeah, I think w one thing that's vital to point out at the moment is that, you know, very much like to see an Irish government 
take up that case around, you know, we've lost our voice in the European Parliament. I think that's quite scandalous in, in many ways. And given that we do have a special arrangement in the protocol, it seems to me there's a strong democratic case, at the very least, for this place having observer status within the European Parliament. So whatever new Irish government emerges, we hope it'll be a sort of proactive government that, it, that is doing that. The work we've done previously, for example, on presidential voting rights for Irish citizens outside of the state, you know, we'd like to see that referendum actually happen. We'd like to see that referendum won in the years ahead. So there's there's plenty still to be done, you know, to advance some of the things we're talking about here. So. Very good. We could talk for hours and hours, but hopefully we'll speak to both of you again in not too distant future. Uh, Mark, just for uh, forget, do you do social media? I don't. You don't? I don't. No, what, what is it with you, man? Technophobe <laughs> as well, yeah. <laughs> Guys, um, yeah. I think, I, if you don't mind, I would just like to take this opportunity to promote Shared Ireland's first public event. Mm. It's going to be on Tuesday, mm. February the 25th at the Greenvale Hotel in Cookstown, County Tyrone, right in the heart of okay. Mid-Ulster. Okay. Colin, you have kindly agreed to participate okay. as a panellist. Yeah. And um, have you any thoughts on what you're going to speak about? Or? Well, again, I've, I've really overdone the praise of Shared Ireland on this podcast. Not today. at all. I'll give you a 20 quick um, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think, look, I do want to acknowledge the contribution you make this event is fundamentally significant. You couldn't have a more timely event in terms of what's been happening in the last few weeks and months. I think what's striking looking at the, 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 the event is it's both focused on where we've come from on the past, but it's also future orientated as well. So I think it's an incredibly timely event. So I really just underline to all your listeners today to come along to join the conversation but I think what's unique about this event is the way in which it's both thinking about where we've come from in the past and helping to think about that and shaping the future direction of travel because ultimately you know there'll be a lot of thought in the next few years about 100 years of this island and I think we do need to think about the next 100 years and about how we do things differently radically differently in the next 100 years so please come along everyone come along and mainly participate, <coughs> join in the conversation. You're quite right, Colin, that the title and theme of our event is Exploring Our Past, Shaping Our Future. The exploring our past, while I guess we don't want to get bogged down on it and let us prevent, hold us back from moving forward, but I think there's a general consensus within society, unless we address issues from the past, as a society, we are unable to move forward and lessons to be learned. And then shaping our future is obviously all about future constitutional arrangements. And in relation to that, I suppose, in terms of legacy issues and legacy of conflict, I think one of the things here that we need to stress too is that you know, there's a lot of solutions out there to some of the problems that this society has faced, and they're comprehensive solutions. They're not piecemeal ad hoc solutions. Mm -hmm. They're comprehensive solutions that are meant to address all the legacies of the conflict here. You know, the Stormont Disagreement is there. There's promises in, have I got the name right, New Decade, New Approach, mm -hmm. in terms of taking that forward. You know, we need to see that done on a comprehensive basis. There, there's a big, big problem in that society, in this society with a sort of piecemeal approach. So it's great to see that as part of this conversation as well about where, where we're going next. And just uh, to finally, um, unashamedly, finish plugging our event. Our lineup is yourself, Professor Connell, um, Ulster Unionist MLA Mike Nesbitt, uh, Relatives for Justice and um, Anderstown News reporter Andre Murphy, Sinn Féin MLA Emma Sheeran, uh, Reverend David Latimer, um, Danny Morrison, Linda Irvine, which is an Irish language activist, Malachi Quinn from the SDLP, which is a local Mid Ulster based councillor, and then we have an Alliance representative, Matthew Beaumont, from up around, I believe he's Fermanagh based, an Alliance representative. It's free for anyone to turn up on the night, but we would strongly encourage all our listeners to pre register via the Eventbrite link, which will be or can be found as our pinned tweet on our um, Twitter account. Uh, which is at Shared Ireland. We also have a website where you can uh, go through our previous podcasts and our archives, um, and it is www.sharedireland.com. 
and it'll tell you a little bit about who Shared Ireland is, what our aims are and what our objectives are as we move forward. So thank you very much for listening, folks. And if you do like what you heard today, a like and a retweet would be appreciated and speak to you all again soon. Take care. Bye bye.